you're such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Rick McKenna, but today's case is the Valentine's Day murder of Richard Showick. Now, you can never truly know what's being said about you, what others have planned, what they are capable of, secrets hidden, lies spread, but all you see is fake smiles pointed back at you. This is about how a day for love turned into a day tainted by hate. And if you don't know, it is my absolute passion to tell these stories, and I mean absolutely no harm or disrespect when I do so. So if you want to support me in that journey, then make sure to subscribe because this month is Foul Play February, where I will be posting so much on Thursdays and Sundays, so make sure you don't miss out. Now let's get back to the story. So it was 2010 in Georgia and Richard and Stacy Showick lived in Snellville. Now Richard had adopted two of Stacy's young sons that were from another marriage. Stacy was said to be a hardworking nurse who ran her own clinic, which was the Georgia Spine and Neurosurgery Center, and she made sure she could provide for her sons. So her husband Richard was the type of guy who made sure everyone was included and taken care of. Richard was said to be kind and gentle. He was creative, outgoing, and fun. He loved how air balloons as well as motorcycles and helping his sons with their boy scout adventures he absolutely loved children especially stacy's boys and he was also a graphic designer by trade as well now together they were loving parents who had been married for about three years now after they eloped and richard began to be a stay-at-home dad for his sons after this however on february 14th on valentine's day richard who was 45 years old at this point would be found dead at Belton Ridge Park in Lula. Now, this was almost an hour from their home and he had just been making Valentine's Day dinner for his wife and her grandparents that they were all going to sit down for because, of course, her grandparents were too old to take care of themselves, so they often did for them. Now, he was found a ways away from their home as well and he was in the dark lying in the snow right next to his truck it was still running with the door ajar the keys were still in the ignition and it was worth about forty thousand dollars but the car hadn't been stolen richard's wallet with cash inside as well as his wedding ring and his watch were all still on him as well his wife stacy had been the one to call 911 around 9 30 p.m when she arrived at this park to find her husband deceased you see they had planned to meet at this park and exchange gifts as well as some intimate moments. Basically, they were trying to relive teenage years of just meeting somewhere and having like a little makeout session before having to go home to their parents. But instead of this going home to their parents, getting in the way, it was kind of work and children that would get in the way. So they decided that after work, they would meet up and have this little rendezvous in the park. It was secluded and it was also overlooking the Chattahoochee River. And so they just thought it would be the perfect place to add some romance and some mystery to their lives. However, once she arrived at this location, he was already there and she said that she felt that something was horribly wrong before even finding his body. At this point, his killer was also already said to be gone as well. Now, investigators were taking Richard in for an autopsy and it was found he had been shot three times in the chest, two times in the head, and once in the hand. Now, investigators claim that this was an over-the-top shooting and as Stacy grieved the loss of her husband and went home to tell her kids on this day that was supposed to be for love, investigators were looking for his killer. People that knew Richard said that they didn't believe anyone would intentionally hurt this man, especially a guy like him. And when the truth finally came out, it was much crazier than anyone could have predicted. You see, this park wasn't one that many people frequented. There wasn't a park for children. There were no playgrounds. It was basically just a small forest with this river in the middle of nowhere. It was also the perfect place for murder. Now, I say that because five people had already been killed in this area. 
The police said that there was places in this park with zero lighting and so it made it especially hard to patrol, especially when it was raining. Now, in fact, in 1973, 31 years prior, a man had been discovered there. He was in the back of his truck as it sunk into the river and when they finally got him out, they realized that he had been shot in the head and killed prior to his truck being put in the river. He was 45 year old Edmund Turner and there was another man who was Jackie Morris, who was 38 years old, who was found nearby, dead in his truck after it had been burned. So you might be thinking, well, this was the work of a serial killer who had been free for decades, right? Who had been killing innocent people who entered this park and had been getting away with it for years. Well, at first it seemed like that. At first glance, you saw multiple victims in the same area with gunshots and being left for dead and not really caring if their bodies were found. They were almost just left down the open like the killer knew this was not going to be connected to them. However, Edmund and Jackie's killers, the two men that they found in the park way before they found Richard's body, these two men's cases had been solved. You see, it had been found that they were hanging out with two men about a night prior to their murder and this was Keith Fair and Dexter Thomas and they were all drinking when they decided to burn down a home of a man who had gotten Edmund arrested at one point. Edmund asked them if they could do this. Edmund said he would pay them to do so. However, once they did, Edmund didn't pay as much as the other boys wanted him to and so they killed him. They then put his truck in the river and then it was Jackie's turn. They ended up taking Jackie's car and saying they needed to burn it due to the evidence of Edmund's murder and then they started burning it and they made sure Jackie was still inside. Keith and Dexter had both been arrested. Keith was sentenced to death and Dexter was sentenced to life. So this wasn't the work of a serial killer. At least these two murders weren't connected and they definitely didn't connect to Richard's murder that happened 31 years afterwards because they were still in prison. Yet another murder occurred on the timeline between Edmund and Jackie's murders and Richard's murders. This was in 1981 when 23 year old Mark Donnie was found in the Chattahoochee River as well. This time he was stabbed in the chest. However, this MO didn't match and his killers had been found as well. You see, Mark had picked up two young hitchhikers and had been driving them and they ended up killing him and putting him in the river. Then, three years later, in 1984, an unidentified woman was found deceased in the park. She was a young white female, around 18 to 25 years old, and about 5 to 5 foot 4. She was in a reddish wig and also had reconstructive surgery on her right eye. She had a metal pin and plate on her left ankle, and she was also wearing a brown corduroy jacket with George on it, as well as western boots with fleece lining and a short-sleeved pullover shirt with a Playboy bunny on it with blue jeans. Investigators believe that she was a sex worker and was murdered elsewhere, but she is now known as the Cobb County Jane Doe, and she is still unidentified. However, this was still 26 years prior to Richard's murder, and so it seemed like too far of a timeline for there to be in a connection, especially when there wasn't a ton of murders exactly the same throughout the years. But a case was then found that was even more recent, and this was in 2004, just six years prior to Richard's murder. A 20-year-old man named James Carlton Smith was found stabbed in the park. He was said to be at a party there when there ended up being a fight and two men were going at it and he tried to stop the fight only to be stabbed to death. However, when multiple witnesses from the party were talked to, they said there was never a fight, that he was never killed by anyone there. This man who investigators first looked at as being James's killer was charged and then he was acquitted of the crime. So this case is still unsolved as well. It seemed like there was quite a bit of crime and murder happening in this area and it was such a small town yet none of it really seemed to be connected. How was this even possible? When Richard was found there, no one was really surprised, but the last two murders that had occurred hadn't been solved. So everyone was worried that this would be yet another case that investigators just didn't know 
what had went wrong. No one felt good about them being able to find Richard's killer, but they were doing their best and they began to find in the soft dirt that was around the truck in Richard's body that there were imprints of tire tracks and there was one that matched Richard's truck, one that matched Stacy's car, and then there was another set of tracks as well. They went from the crime scene to the road, yet these would not be easy to track down and investigators were searching online, they were going to different stores until they finally found a match that was Goodyear Integrity. The only thing was, even though this matched the tread marks, it was something that was common that many cars in the area used, and so they had to find a person that was connected to the murder and then also see if they had those tires, which was going to be so much harder than they originally thought. Now, Richard Showick had his funeral on February 20th, and all of his guests were asked to wear bright colors instead of the usual black because he was such an artistic, colorful man, and so this is what everyone was wearing, and Stacy was said to be weeping in the crowd. She had also arranged for his ashes to be spread from a hot air balloon, which is something he would have loved. Then another clue was found, and this was from Richard's wife, Stacy. She had claimed at the crime scene that she had a secret, and when investigators talked to her, she said she'd been having an affair on her husband with a man named Juan Reyes. Now, she admitted this had been happening for about a year, and that she even hired this man to work at her clinic for an uh, assistant surgeon job, even though he had no medical experience. He wasn't just a janitor or a receptionist or something that was, you know, training. He was full-on a surgeon assistant with no idea what he was doing. However, she said she was in love with him and that he was a single father and she often gave him money for him and his kids to be able to live on and she would give them gifts as well. She said that they had an apartment together where they would go and be intimate. She also paid for Juan to have a house for his kids to live in. She paid for his truck. She took him on vacations and she took their, his children out all the time for anything they needed all while she had this other life where she had her own kids and husband. I guess like any marriage, we have our problems. I mean, we have ups and downs and things like that, but nothing, nothing was, you know. Nothing major, just. I mean, he's, he and my middle son have a lot of, I don't know, they butt. Bigger and back and forth. They butt heads a lot. We've been in counseling about that over the last, you know, six months, we've had, you know, so, I mean, what, I was frustrated, yes, I was irritated with my marriage. He was like, come meet me at the park, you know, it's all secluded, you know, it'll right. be, I mean, we'll exchange our valentines, and, and when he gave me a kiss, he was like, and maybe even make out a little, you know, I mean, it's mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And as I turned in, I knew something was wrong. I could see, I saw his truck immediately and because the lights were on and his, you know, there's a light when your door is open that lights onto the, um, you know, it's on the, bed, the back the, of the cab. The car lights for the bed. And I saw that. And so I pulled down and I headed right toward his truck. But as soon as I, my, I could see him, I could see him laying on the ground. He wasn't breathing, he wasn't, there was nothing. I went to go take his carotid pulse, but I I was just on the phone and I could just, you know, I, you could just tell that he wasn't, mm -hmm. that he was already dead. He was, there was no attempts at respirations. There was no, nothing. I, they asked me what it was going, you know, I told them that I needed help, that my husband was here and, and it, that something bad had happened and that he was dead and he's, you know, I could see the hole on his chin. When did the affair start? Well, that's why I was saying it's kind of, you know, I mean, it was five years ago. That was before I even met Richard. And right. then so Juan had, went through a, a divorce and, and then, and you know, he moved to Florida and I would just communicate with him via email. We just stayed friends, you know, and then, um, but there was always some, you know, there was always something there between us as far as just communicating. And I didn't see him for three years. Okay. But, but you had a relationship with him before he moved, though? 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so when did he come back from I Florida? I don't know when he moved back. I saw him for the first time in, um, I guess it was probably April of '09. Okay. So Richard never knew about your affair then? I mean, I'm sure that he had um, ideas, you know. I'm sure he was suspicious. Mm-hmm. Did they ever confront you about um, it? or? No. No. I mean, when back in April when Juan came back in, you know, and, uh, and I had told Richard, I said, I think I'm going to hire him to work. He needs the job. He needs to take care of his family. He's always been, I mean, Richard's always known about Juan, known that Juan was a very good friend of mine, you know, and knew that we had a relationship before. And when he started in the office, I mean, Richard did say, he said, are you about to have an affair? And at that point, and I, I said, no, of course not, because at that point I had no intent of that. Um, but it did, but it changed. Well, Stacy, there's no doubt that you love Richard. I do. I, I, I do. I, I, I do. I swear. I don't doubt I that for a second. I would never want anything bad to happen to him for a second. And I don't doubt that either. Okay. And we are going to find out what happened to him, for sure. Okay. We'll find out. Okay. If there's anything that you know. That you, that, you, that you have not told us to this point, right now is the time that you got to tell me. Okay. Okay? Because if we start getting into this thing and we start branching out and it starts coming back in, in a circle and it starts heading back in your direction, I, that's a bad situation for you to be in. And that's a bad position for you to be in. Do you understand? Yes. Because that is a very secluded park. That is a very remote area of our county. Mm-hmm. Okay? So you understand that we have to weigh... Did a stranger do this, or is it something else? And on the something else category, you got a lot going on. Do you understand? There's a lot going on in your life that that starts to tip the scales away from this being a stranger. Do you understand that? I do. Okay. Well, it's important that if our investigation is going to take us in that direction, and it's going to come back to something that you could have helped us out with tonight, we're going to need to know it tonight. I don't know. I just... Stacy was saying she feared that Juan had done something to her husband that night out of revenge. And investigators found a picture of Juan and they went to pick him up for questioning. Yet, he did not look like what he looked like in the picture. He had this long beard in this picture that they were looking for and he had shaved this off when they picked him up. They thought that this was really peculiar that he would want to change his appearance so close to this murder. And so, they wondered if this was to cover his tracks, to make a witness who had seen somebody flee the crime scene not be able to pinpoint it to him. Well, Juan was brought in and he claimed he had nothing to do with it. He said that he would take a polygraph if that's what they wanted and investigators then asked him where he was on Valentine's Day evening and he said that he was at home with his ex-wife who was kind of still his wife and their children and that at one point he went to Blockbuster with his son to pick out a movie and then he went home. The rest of that night they had dinner and then went to bed around three hours later which was around 10 p.m. Juan said even though he was also separated from his wife he was really trying to get back in good graces with her and try to make the marriage work again and that Stacy was basically just an in-between that he was sleeping with occasionally. To corroborate this, investigators then brought in Juan's ex-wife and she was questioned on where Juan was that night or if she knew any information. She was claiming that Juan was constantly bringing Stacy over to the house. She would pay their bills, she would spend any amount of money on them, on their kids, and so she thought it was really weird, but she didn't say no because of that. She said Stacy was always over for the holidays and that on Valentine's Day, Juan had just gone out to Blockbuster and came home and slept right next to her the whole night. At this point, Juan had to be released. There was nothing to connect him to this murder and he had this person who was saying that he was right next to her the entire night. So months were going by and Richard's killer was still on the loose until a man came forward with another tip. Now, he found something extremely strange, and after hearing this, investigators realized that they had been face-to-face with a killer this whole 
time. Her name was Stacy Showick. You see, Stacy Showick had been born on August 19th of 1974, and her father passed away when she was young. She was raised by a single mother, she went to Jacksonville University, and she was believed to have attachment issues that caused her to have many problems. She'd gone to college for psychology and nursing, and her first husband became her husband when she first graduated. She then had three more husbands before marrying Richard. He was her fifth. By this point, she had three sons and three years later, Stacy was also in a deep affair with another man. It was believed that Richard knew about this, but he wanted to make the marriage work anyway. However, little did he know, Stacy had another plan and she wanted to get rid of him. Now, the tip that was called in from this person that was so strange was an IT man from Stacy's job. He worked on all of the computers and he claimed that he was brought in to clear emails about weekly and he never had a problem with Stacy's emails before, but this week when he went to do it, he noticed that all of Stacy's emails that weekend were gone were completely erased. He said it was completely unusual, this never happened, and fearing that the emails were gone forever, investigators were worried they would never catch her. However, the tech then told them he had backups. 4,000 emails were sent the investigators way and there was one that caught everyone's eye. This was a bank transfer for $8,902. This was to go to a woman named Lenitra Ross and this was sent a few weeks before the murder. And then just two days before the murder, another bank transfer to this same woman for $1,100, making it an even 10,000. Investigators wanted to find out who this woman was, and she wasn't hard to find either. You see, Lenitra Ross worked as a co-worker to Stacy, and she was also renting one of Stacy's homes. But Lenitra claimed when she was talked to that the $10,000 was for repairs for the home that she was staying in that Stacy owned, and, and that Stacy was paying her to fix it. She said that there had been a water line leak and that is what all the money was needed for. Now, the only other evidence that pointed to Lenitra being involved was when they went outside to her driveway and saw a Chevy Impala with Goodyear Integrity tires. These were the same tire marks as the third tire marks found at the crime scene. However, they couldn't be certain that this meant that this car had been there until things got even more strange. Stacy's own family member, who was her cousin, called the police. Her cousin's name was Connie Hearn, and she said that the Chevy Impala was one she knew well because it belonged to Stacy's grandparents and she was supposed to be selling it for them and giving them back the money to pay their medical bills. She had even said she had sold it for $14,000 but never gave the money to her grandparents. It was missing the time of the murder as well. So, did Lenitra Ross kill Richard? If so, why? Did Stacy ask her to? Well, Richard's family believed that Stacy was always responsible. It was then found that Richard's $500,000 life insurance policy had been taken out by Stacy herself prior to his murder. Investigators then began looking at the phone records of the phone tower close to the murder scene, and they looked at Stacy's contacts to see if any of these numbers who had made calls near this tower matched numbers in Stacy's phone so that there could be a connection. And that is when this whole investigation began to unravel because a number that was saved under Reggie, aka Mr. Result, was in Stacy's phone and had also made a phone call that hit this tower. It was at 8.40 p.m., almost an hour prior to the 911 call. And this was a call that went from Reggie to Lenitra Ross. And this was from the very park that Richard was murdered at. Three minutes later, Stacy got a text from Lenitra saying, I forgot to tell you I'm not coming into work tomorrow. By the way, happy Valentine's Day. And that is when Stacy headed out to meet her husband, who was already deceased. So who was Mr. Results? Was his suspicious name an indicator of what he had done? Well, it turned out he was Reggie Coleman. He was a personal trainer who had grown up in the foster care system and he had a criminal record, but it was only charges to do with drugs, not violence. He also taught boot camps at Stacy's office and he was the on-again, off-again boyfriend of Lenitra, as well as Lenitra's baby's 
father. Investigators now realize this was a murder for hire. Reggie had called Lenitra at 8.40 to let her know that Richard was dead, and Lenitra sent the signal to Stacy with the text message she sent her. And that's when Stacy headed to meet her deceased husband. At this point, investigators knew who Richard's killer was and who had caused all of this, but they couldn't just start arresting people at random and they knew that. Whether they arrested one or two, somebody would talk and the others would run. So, they wanted to get all of them at once so nobody could run, nobody could get away and nobody could tip off the others. So this was called Operation Tangled Web. And even with all of this planning and them arresting them all practically at one time, Stacy still got away. You see, she was in her building where somebody at her office actually tipped her off, the police were there, and she began to run. She locked herself in this office where only people with a key could go in. And that's where she stayed for a really long time. She refused to let them in. But soon enough, she did finally give in and let them arrest her. All of them were immediately denying they had anything to do with it, even with all of the proof. I mean, they had found out that Reggie had been the one that was paid the $10,000 as well as the Impala and that Lenitra was actually going to be given the deed to the home she was living at that was Stacy's. Now, when Stacy was questioned, she began to talk and she immediately gave investigators a motive. She claimed she had started to confide in Lenitra at work and then over lunch and then one day they began to talk about the fact that Stacy believed her children were being sexually assaulted by Richard. They were at a Mexican restaurant, they were talking about all of this, and she said that her son had gone up to her one day after she got home and said that she didn't know what Richard did to them when she wasn't home. Immediately, Lenitra said that she had someone who could help her out with that. Now, Stacy said that she was also sexually assaulted as a child and never wanted that to happen to her sons, and so this set her plan in motion to kill Richard. She said she wanted to be the judge, the jury, and the executioner, and Lenitra supplied her with a man for the job. They all met up, and Stacy said she knew the perfect place to do this, so they went to this Belton Ridge Park. They scouted it out. This was also super close to where her grandparents lived. That's why she knew it, and they all said it was basically the perfect place for murder. Yet Stacy then said everything went wrong because this was supposed to look like a robbery. It was supposed to be one gunshot. There were supposed to be things stolen from Richard. And she said Reggie didn't do any of that, even though she had even given him money to buy the gun. She said that night she had gone to her grandparents' apartment and she was looking after them after work. Richard actually met her there, but she told him to go ahead and go to the park and she would meet him to exchange the gifts and have the little rendezvous. However, she was actually talking on the phone with Lenitra, telling her what color car that he was driving so Reggie could better kill him. Stacy said when she got the signal from Lenitra he was dead, she actually called his cell phone to make sure he didn't pick up before heading to the crime scene. But it was found that Stacy's motive wasn't the truth at all because Stacy had, had admitted that she heard her son all wrong and that what he said wasn't what she thought he meant. That her son was simply telling her Richard was more disciplined over her and that when the boys were home with him, they made him mind, whereas she didn't. And that's what he was talking about. He had never sexually assaulted them. He had never laid a hand on them at all. But possibly due to her past traumas, she immediately thought the, the worst possible meaning of what he said and ended up setting up this plan to kill him. But investigators weren't sure that this was even what had happened. They thought that it was possible that Stacy was just worried that Richard was going to eventually leave her and then take her children from her since he was the number one caregiver at that point. And that when they divorced and she wanted away from him, he would take everything instead. So she felt that this was her only way out. So Stacy Showick was actually offered a plea deal that if she testified against Reggie and Lenitra, she could avoid the death penalty and that's exactly what she did. She pled guilty on December 3rd and it was said that she was the engine that put this train in motion even though she didn't actually pull the trigger. Family of Richard said she might not have pulled the trigger, but she may as well have loaded the gun. 
They called her the worst kind of evil. Reggie Coleman was also pleading guilty and he was sentenced to life. However, Lenitra Ross was given the chance at a plea deal. This would mean she would only get 20 years if she were to testify against Reggie, her baby daddy. And this is what she refused to do. So when Stacy testified against her, saying she did know all about the murder that she put her in contract with Reggie, she was given life in prison. It was said that Lenitra never appeared remorseful for what she had done. She had no respect for human life and no sense of guilt for her actions. However, her mother said she was just a single mother trying to get by and did it more for the money than anything else. It was also theorized by her defense that she had no idea there was actually a murder happening and she believed she was hiring Reggie for Stacy for a carjacking. Richard's family would talk about him at the trial saying that he cared for youth and elders all the same and that he was always there for their family in times of need. Now, Lenitra ended up appealing her sentence, but this was denied and Stacy's sons have said that they miss their mommy, but they also miss their daddy, Richard. I feel like a lot of the time when I was researching this case, because Stacy had said that Richard had sexually assaulted the boys, which was false, that Richard was kind of looked down upon in this case, even though he was the victim. And I'm really not sure why, because he seemed like a wonderful human being who had his life ripped away, but it really did seem like everybody just stuck with this, this story of what Stacy had said he did. I don't know if Richard felt like he could live with the infidelity for a long period of time. I think Richard was willing to work on the marriage and try to make things better so that Stacy wouldn't turn to somebody else. But I feel like with the combination of so many other things going on, it started wearing both Stacy and Richard down. And that led to their fighting. And it just progressively got worse. Um, Stacy did, I know, go into work one morning, got there early, went to the break room, and Lenitra was there. And it was a matter of Stacy sat down and made the statement that she wished sometimes Richard was dead. I don't believe she meant it. She said she didn't mean it. I also managed to find an interesting bit of information about Stacy's family members that happened after the murder. This was six years after, and it was 2016, when Lori Morgan, who is Stacy's aunt, who was interviewed during this whole process, you know, about Stacy and the murder and all of that, she was actually arrested as well. The SWAT team had to storm her property to arrest her due to the fact that she was keeping her four-week-old grandson hostage with a gun. It was said she was drunk, she had an argument with the baby's father, and then she held the baby at gunpoint until the officers arrived. That's when she had this gun and she fired. Thankfully, this did not hurt the baby and she fired at the police, but the SWAT was called because of this and they arrested her, the baby was rescued and the baby was checked over, it was fine but Lori was charged for aggravated assault and reckless conduct. But what do you think Stacy's real motive was? Was she so triggered by the thought of her children going through what she went through that she thought that murder was the only answer? I mean, trauma can have such deep psychological effects, but that doesn't make it okay to kill. Did she feel that since she didn't speak up against her abuser, she had to do it for her sons? Or did this have nothing to do with it at all and she just wanted, wanted an excuse for people to make her look like the victim, even though she just wanted her husband dead? This case is horrendous and truthfully to me, I feel like she just wanted to be with her boyfriend and was sick and tired of having divorce after divorce and having to deal with her ex-husbands. And the fifth one was the last straw and she took his life or had it done for her. And she thought she was gonna get away with it too. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Don't forget it's Foul Play February, so come back on Thursdays and Sundays, and don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough, and I love you to absolute pieces. Okay, bye.